this video, we will unveil the power of salt as a weapon in spiritual warfare. We will speak clearly and simply so that everyone can understand its pure and correct use. Pay attention, did you know, there are three things you can do with salt to break every curse and bring blessings of abundance upon you. Why do you think Jesus told his disciples that they are the salt of the earth? Keep watching this video until it concludes as I will reveal the answer, guaranteeing that you will be astonished by the profound significance of salt as a spiritual tool. Initially, it is essential to recognize an undeniable reality every element was brought into existence by the divine hand of God, through him and for him. Nothing lies beyond his will, implying that the creation of salt serves a specific purpose designated by God. The entirety of existence, from the smallest grain of salt to the vast expanse of the universe, is a manifestation of his creative power. In the book of Genesis, it is outlined that at the dawn of creation, God formed the heavens and the earth, including the creation of salt as a fundamental mineral. Often overlooked is the truth that God bestows authority not solely upon humans, but also upon plants, animals, and elements. Each facet of creation holds a sacred role. Consider the characteristics of fire and water fire possesses the power to consume, while water bestows life. Similarly, salt is endowed with the capacity to season and preserve. Fire engulfs, water nurtures, and salt conserves and purifies all serving as instruments in the divine plan. Let us ponder deeply just as salt preserves food, might it not also sustain our faith during times of adversity? I would like to pause briefly and encourage you to share your encounters with salt in the comments section. The narratives of fellow Christians often serve as sources of inspiration and fortification for many individuals. Numerous people have found solace and recovery through its application. For instance, a certain individual witnessed a remarkable transformation in her life after anointing her hands with salt. Have you experienced improvement after incorporating salt into your prayers? Share your personal account of how God has acted in your life through this potent mineral. Let us now resume with the video. Historically, salt was believed to possess remarkable abilities. It not only preserved meat and enhanced flavor, but was also utilized as a form of currency in ancient Rome. Salaries for public officials were disbursed in salt, hence the origin of the term salary. While Jesus frequently used parables for instruction, not everything is symbolic. Oil, bread, and wine hold significant roles in Christian traditions. So why do we readily accept the use of oil but harbor doubts regarding the efficacy of salt? Some individuals associate salt with malevolent practices, a misconception propagated by the adversary. Recall the words in John 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. The adversary seeks to distort the truth concerning salt. The spiritual realm intersects with the physical God employs his creations to fulfill his divine purpose. Consider oil as an example. Anointing oil is referenced 20 times in the scriptures. In the Old Testament, it was utilized to consecrate the high priest and his descendants, as well as to sanctify the tabernacle and its contents for Jehovah. Specific instructions regarding the anointing oil can be found in Leviticus 8 and Exodus 25, with Exodus 30 explicitly forbidding its replication for personal use. The composition of the anointing oil included mirror, cinnamon, and various natural elements. There is no indication that the oil or its components possess supernatural qualities. Rather, it was the obedience to God through the ritual that symbolized sanctity. If God instructs you to anoint with oil, heed his directive. Let us contemplate deeply God beckons us to utilize his creations with intentionality. If he commands the use of oil, we comply. Why not afford the same reverence to salt? By disregarding this potent tool bestowed upon us by God, we overlook a formidable instrument. Similar to oil, salt holds a sacred significance when employed in accordance with God's will. In Matthew 5, the scripture proclaims, You are the salt of the earth, let us safeguard this truth from the clutches of the enemy. Only a handful of passages in the New Testament reference anointing with oil. In Luke 7, Mary reverently anoints Jesus' feet, while in James 5, the church elders administer anointing to the sick for healing. Hebrews 1 illustrates God anointing Jesus with the oil of joy, affirming your throne, O God, is eternal. These instances underscore how God utilizes physical elements to mirror the spiritual and enact his divine plan. Reflect on Moses' staff as another illustration. 
God imbued power into the staff that Moses wielded, demonstrating his authority. When Jehovah queried, what is in your hand? Moses replied, a staff. Instructed to cast it on the ground, Moses obeyed, transforming it into a serpent, prompting Moses to retreat. Through this sign, they will believe that Jehovah has appeared to you. Prophets employed water, salt, oil, cloaks, and staffs in their ministries, recognizing them as instruments in prophetic acts rather than objects of worship. They comprehended that these everyday elements, when consecrated, could transcend mere ritualistic practices. Everything discussed thus far is firmly rooted in the teachings of the Bible, unaltered and pure, representing the Word of God. The adversary is a deceiver. In certain regions, the term it's salty signifies misfortune, often linked to witchcraft, given the knowledge that malevolent forces may employ salt in cursing rituals. Dismissing such practices would be tantamount to disregarding the existence of evil in the world. Evil and malevolent individuals exist, there is no divine origin to so-called white magic. Any action not guided by the Holy Spirit and biblical principles falls under the category of witchcraft. The adversary, as a usurper, distorts and mimics God's creations, endeavoring to pervert divine tools for his own gain. During the temptation of Jesus recounted in Matthew 4, Satan offered in dominion over earthly kingdoms a power originally bestowed upon humanity by God. Despite this gift, Satan attempted to entice Jesus by presenting the kingdoms of the world from a lofty vantage point, proposing, I will give you all this if you bow down and worship me. Through humanity's disobedience, relinquishing their authority, Satan unlawfully seized dominion over the worldly realms. Let us engage in profound contemplation. Do we recognize how the adversary endeavors to distort the sacred? Are we utilizing the gifts imparted by God with reverence and intentionality? It is crucial to always bear in mind that the physical can mirror the spiritual, and our responsibility is to wield these tools with unwavering faith and obedience to God, echoing the wisdom of Ephesians 6, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. The scriptures indicate that God and his prophets were the first to employ salt following its creation. The narrative of Sodom and Gomorrah chronicled in Genesis 19 serves as a poignant example. Lot, enticed by worldly pleasures devoid of divine guidance, opted to dwell in these morally corrupt cities. The depths of sexual depravity and sin there reached the heavens. God penalized Lot's wife for her defiance by transforming her into a pillar of salt. In this instance, salt was utilized as a means of retribution for disobedience, a tool wielded not by Satan, but by God to administer justice. Leviticus 2 stipulates, season all your grain offerings with salt. Do not neglect the salt of the covenant of your God in your grain offerings, add salt to all your offerings. Here, God mandates the inclusion of salt in every offering. The term every offering denotes inclusivity without exceptions, while the directive to not neglect underscores the perpetual nature of this practice for the Israelites. The act of salting the offerings was imperative for purging impurities. This passage unveils another facet of salt, its purifying essence. In Chronicles, it is stated, Do not know that the Lord, the God of Israel, has given the kingdom over Israel to David and his descendants through a covenant of salt forever. God forges covenants with humanity utilizing simple and elemental tools like salt. This verse illuminates another attribute of salt, its enduring nature in sealing covenants. We have observed three key attributes of salt within the spiritual realm, its capacity to purify, to establish covenants, and even to invoke curses. These characteristics unveil the profound significance and divine intent behind the utilization of this mineral. Let us now take a moment for contemplation. Why do practitioners of witchcraft employ salt in their rituals? They specifically harness this element due to their understanding of the spiritual essence embodied by salt. They recognize it as a substance crafted by the Almighty, transcending both the physical and metaphysical planes endowed with these specific authorities. If turned against them, salt could yield substantial harm. The adversary has endeavored to propagate the notion that salt serves solely as a malevolent tool wielded by sorcerers, seeking to mislead Christians and the broader populace. 
Today, however, you will come to realize that salt is far more than a relic of the Old Testament relegated to oblivion. Today, you will grasp that the covenant of salt endures eternally, and any cessation in its utilization by Christians stems from crafty deception. Today marks the moment to cast off the veils of deceit. Today heralds the arrival of truth. Praise be to God. Salt and the curse. In the initial stages of our exploration, we witnessed the transformation of Lot's wife into a pillar of salt, a narrative intricately intertwined with the account of Sodom and Gomorrah. In Deuteronomy 29, it is noted in the coming generations, your descendants who will emerge after you and the foreigner arriving from distant lands when they witness the plagues and diseases that the Lord has inflicted upon that region, the sulfur and salt decimating its entirety. It shall remain barren, unproductive, devoid of any vegetation, akin to the devastation wrought upon Sodom and Gomorrah, obliterated by the Lord's fury and wrath. Sulfur and salt symbolize a curse upon the land, thwarting the growth of any flora. Salt, in conjunction with sulfur, signifies destruction. It is imperative to comprehend why practitioners of sorcery harness salt. What was initially intended for justice is now turned against God's children, not because salt itself is malevolent, but due to our abandonment of prophetic rituals and the tools bestowed upon us. Salt stands as our rightful inheritance. As a true child of God, you need not dread the sorcerer who wields salt against your household, employment, or enterprise. You possess the authority to annul any sorcery and nullify curses. Zephaniah 2 proclaims, therefore, as I live, declares the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Moab shall become like Sodom, and the Ammonites like Gomorrah, a wasteland of nettles and a pit of salt, an eternal desolation. The survivors of my people shall plunder them, and the remnants of my people shall inherit them. Salt intertwines the fates of Sodom and Gomorrah with Moab and Ammon. Moab and Ammon are the offspring of the incestuous union between Lot and his daughters, born subsequent to the obliteration of Sodom and Gomorrah. This abominable act engendered two wicked nations that persistently waged war against Israel. Sexual deviance begets generational curses. Numerous individuals remain oblivious as to why their families grapple with issues, broken marriages or abuse. The origins may lie in the immoral deeds of forebears. Frequently we are confounded by familial tribulations or the prevalence of marital discord, criminality and victimization within our Christian circles. This constitutes an undoubtedly tragic circumstance. The root cause could trace back to the transgressions inherited from our ancestors. To liberate your progeny from these curses, the preceding verse from Zephaniah furnishes a solution. Seize the salt sanctified to God and recite this supplication. Almighty Father, God of Israel, I offer my gratitude for guiding me and bestowing your divine word upon me. Pardon the transgressions of my kin, my forebears, and my parents. Forgive the sexual improprieties that have plagued my lineage. Today I take the salt sanctified at your altar to expunge the malevolence that has long afflicted my family. I sprinkle the salt upon my abdomen. The desolation that once marred the abode of Sodom and Gomorrah now dissipates. Henceforth I renounce all wickedness, allowing your truth, benevolence, and compassion to reign over me and my descendants. In the mighty name of Jesus, Amen. Salt serves as a unique element in biblical contexts, being employed both for blessings and curses. It stands as a divine weapon passed down to God's children. Yet the adversary manipulates it against us. Fear not. Jesus proclaimed you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. Throughout the Bible, salt emerges in narratives of both curse and blessing. Psalm 107 recounts he turned rivers into a desert, flowing springs into thirsty ground, and fruitful land into a salt waste because of the wickedness of those who lived there. Salt symbolizes desolation inflicted upon fertile grounds as a consequence of wrongdoing. Christians seldom resort to salt for cursing, a commendable practice that underscores the importance of genuine love. Nonetheless, a child of God must discern when to wield salt for conflict and when for harmony. Salt embodies both the tools of war and peace. In this context, our focus rests on salt as an instrument of warfare. An army stands poised to defend a nation, ready to engage when invaders seek to seize territory through aggression. 
While the threat remains dormant, the army maintains a state of preparedness, vigilant for war. Regrettably, in the realm of spiritual warfare, the enemy already assaults Christian domains, necessitating the use of salt to counter the adversary's advances. Take the salt consecrated unto God and disperse it within your residence, community, and city. Now I beckon you to assertively proclaim, Eternal Father, God of Israel, today I take the covenant salt and scatter it across my city, household, neighborhood, church, desiccating all the machinations of the adversary. Every enchantment, every idolatrous practice. I annul all compacts forged by sorcerers and witches over this city, issuing an ultimatum to the sorcerer should he fail to repent of his malevolence, he shall face the wrath of the living God. In the name of Jesus, I bind the strong men and restrain every spirit of retribution seeking to assail me and my kin. Henceforth and for all eternity, wickedness shall find no foothold in this city. Let it be inscribed and let it be so in Jesus' name. Salt possesses great potency. In a notable event, Elisha journeyed to a water source, cast in salt, and declared, Thus says the Lord, I have purified these waters. There shall not be any more death or barrenness. This episode stands out as a memorable instance of salt's efficacy. Endowed with a double portion of the spirit, Elisha harnessed the salt given by God to restore the waters in the Lord's name. In Ezekiel 4, it is written, When you have finished making atonement, you shall present an unblemished bull and a faultless ram. The priests shall sprinkle salt on them and offer them as a burnt offering to the Lord. Animals designated for God required purification with salt prior to their sacrifice. This underscores the vital role of salt in the purification rites of the Old Testament. Consider the trajectory of money before it reaches the altar as an offering or tithe. It exchanges numerous hands. Have you pondered the path this money has traversed? It may have passed through the possessions of thieves, murderers, smugglers, brothels, or sorcerers. Salt sanctified to God serves as a purifying implement capable of sanctifying the funds you present at the altar. A fundamental principle applies when consecrating salt for God. Approach it with reverence and esteem. If you procure salt for consecration, acquire an entire package and allocate 100% to God's service. Utilize this salt exclusively for honoring God, reserving it solely for this purpose. Do not split its use between divine service and culinary endeavors. Understand that the salt was acquired solely for altar use. Just as you reserve the salt exclusively for God, the container you employ should also be dedicated for this sacred purpose. Avoid repurposing an old vessel from home, procure a new receptacle and designate it specifically for honoring God. This principle should likewise extend to the use of oil. Numerous churches incorporate the practice of sprinkling salt on tithes and offerings, beseeching God for purification from all impurities, mirroring the guidance in Leviticus 2. While not all congregations engage in this prophetic gesture, some individuals comprehend the importance of presenting pure works before God. Thus, before offering their tithe, they purify it at home with consecrated salt. The covenant, as outlined in Numbers 18, elucidates I have given the offerings of the holy things that the children of Israel offer unto the Lord to you, your sons, daughters, by a perpetual statute. It is an everlasting covenant of salt before the Lord for you and your descendants. We adhere to the same scriptures. This perpetual salt covenant remains relevant today, enduring for those who honor God. You might question, but that pertained to the Israelites. Yet I affirm that you are a branch engrafted under the same Father's love, extended to those who seek Him within the sacred texts. Salt, renowned for its preservative attributes, symbolizes longevity, fidelity, the eternal, serving as an emblem of the enduring covenant. The crux of a covenant lies in its enduring nature, hence making salt an apt emblem for this purpose. In Eastern traditions, salt, for its ability to stave off decay, evolved into a symbol denoting the steadfastness and lasting quality of bonds. Through ancient customs, the act of sharing salt became a ritual to cement friendships. Placing salt in a meal shared between two individuals signifies a pledge of lasting camaraderie, a vow of eternal faithfulness ensuring the perpetual unity of the parties involved. Those who partook in a meal seasoned with salt vowed not to deceive or inflict harm upon each other. It was believed that by consuming a man's salt through a shared meal, a lifelong friendship was forged. 
The Divine intended every sacrifice to serve as a token of the bond with him. During covenant ceremonies, participants often dined together, incorporating salt as a symbol of enduring allegiance and fidelity to the revered covenant. Consequently, it was imperative that a salt covenant be upheld without fail. Numbers 18 stipulates that the breach or betrayal of a salt covenant often carried the penalty of death. On a particular occasion, an American historian found himself researching in a Middle Eastern city as night descended upon him unknowingly. Aware of the perils that the nocturnal roads presented, he sought refuge at one of the tents along his path. Although it was probable that this tent belonged to individuals who preyed on lost travelers, the imminent danger overshadowed such concerns. Approaching the tent, the American conversed with its owner, cautioning him about the hazards of continuing the journey at night due to the distance and potential risks. The tent's occupant revealed his identity as a thief, questioning the traveler's trust in him amidst the looming threat of harm. Undeterred, the traveler proposed a salt covenant to the thief as a gesture of trust. In response, the thief welcomed him, invoking blessings, and they shared a meal seasoned with salt. Come morning, the American awoke to find the thief attentively safeguarding his possessions within the tent. The thief meticulously accounted for the traveler's belongings and returned them with kindness. Subsequently, the American resumed his journey, escorted by the thief who ensured his safety all the way to the intended city. Recognizing that upholding a salt covenant with a fellow man is a service to God, the thief vowed to honor it until his last breath. The tradition of the Salt Covenant in the East endures to this day as a binding agreement that persists even beyond the demise of one of the covenanting parties, lasting until the end of time. A trader ventures into the pasture with the intention of purchasing a hundred sheep, only to discover that the shepherd has three hundred for sale. Realizing he lacks the funds for the entire flock, the merchant is faced with a dilemma. In a moment of ingenuity, the shepherd proposes a pact the merchant will acquire all 300 sheep with the commitment to settle the payment for the excess 200 within 60 days. Sealing the agreement with a meal seasoned with salt, both parties consent to the terms. The trader takes possession of the full flock, but tragedy strikes as he passes away 30 days later. However, his son is well informed about the covenant forged with the shepherd. Upon the sixtieth day, the son upholds his father's promise and settles the outstanding debt with the shepherd. It is crucial to grasp the essence of the salt covenant, a reciprocal bond between mankind and the divine, fostering a harmonious relationship. One cannot merely pledge allegiance to the Lord and then lead a life devoid of reverence. God respects those who revere him. His pledge is to act as a paternal figure to his followers, who in turn become his cherished offspring. Yet, adherence to the commandments of God remains paramount. The scriptures mention the Valley of Salt, a place where triumph awaits those who strive for their blessings. According to historical accounts in 2 Samuel, David's valor shone as he triumphed over numerous adversaries in this valley, earning renown for his victories. The Valley of Salt witnessed pivotal battles in Israelite history, including David's triumph over the Arameans and Amaziah's conquest of the men of Seir. While the exact location remains uncertain, the significance of these victories resonates through the ages, highlighting the divine assistance granted to those who stand firm in their struggles. Reflecting on David's triumph, it becomes evident that victories are won through proactive engagement. Despite the prevalent notion of divine intervention in battles, the narrative underscores the necessity of human effort in securing blessings. While prayer and supplication hold value, action rooted in faith is equally imperative. Just as Jesus exemplified a life of both prayer and action, believers are called to embody their faith through deeds. Like David, individuals must confront their challenges head-on, actively pursuing their aspirations with unwavering faith. The modern inclination towards passivity in the face of adversity contradicts this principle, emphasizing the need for believers to combine their spiritual devotion with resolute action in their pursuit of blessings. Salt holds profound significance for the Israelites. It serves as a symbol of sealing divine covenants, purifying offerings, and possessing the power to bless or curse. On a pivotal day, David stood before his people, aiming to demonstrate that God's covenant rested upon him like salt on his head, assuring them that triumph would be delivered by the hand of Jehovah. To those seeking God's blessings, what actions must you take to secure them? 
Will you passively wait or confine your prayers to the comfort of your home? Is mere church attendance sufficient for you? Often Christians anticipate divine favor without investing in sacrifices or going beyond the minimum requirements of faith. Driven by complacency rather than gratitude, many aspire to receive abundant blessings with minimal effort. What steps should a Christian take to attain blessings? The answer is clear, engage in the struggle. The narrative of David illustrates how salt can either confer blessings or bring about misfortune. Approaching battles with a mindset for victory invites blessings, while a defeatist attitude invites doom such is the nature of the power of salt. If a witch were to curse your dwelling with salt and you lack consecration to God, that curse may manifest. However, recognizing salt as a tool bestowed by God and honoring Him through unwavering fidelity safeguards against plagues and curses. A devout Christian must engage in prayer, fasting, consecration, righteousness, piety, and upright living before God, existing in a state of spiritual alignment. Without spiritual grounding, life remains incomplete. Salt marks the inception of this spiritual warfare. While Jesus often healed through his spoken word, he also utilized prophetic gestures, showcasing his divine lineage. In the account from John 9, Jesus encountered a blind man, when asked by his disciples about the cause of the man's blindness, Jesus clarified that it was an opportunity for God's work to be revealed. Demonstrating God's power, Jesus fashioned mud with saliva, anointed the man's eyes, and directed him to wash in the pool of Siloam, resulting in the man's sight being restored. Perhaps the concept I'm conveying hasn't fully resonated yet, so let me elucidate with examples from the realm of plants. It's a known fact that God is the creator of all things and everything exists to glorify Him. Among His creations, there are plants designed to heal both humans and animals, possessing properties that can combat severe illnesses. Many modern medicines, like aspirin and morphine, find their origins in these plants. The question arises, are plants purely material or do they possess a spiritual dimension? At first glance, one might deem them purely material, given their presence in the physical world we inhabit. However, what if I propose that plants initially emerged in the spiritual realm? At the dawn of creation, when nothing existed but a vast emptiness, suddenly everything came into being. This is the essence of Genesis. The tangible world we inhabit is the result of bridging the spiritual with the material. Initially, these creations existed in the divine mind before manifesting in the mortal realm. As Jeremiah articulates, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. Jesus epitomizes the fusion of spirit and flesh. Miracles unfold when the spiritual transcends into the material domain. Salt, in its basic form, is just a mineral until it merges with the spiritual realm, where it embodies covenant, purification, and blessing. Jesus exemplified this convergence by physically blending spit with earth to form mud, which he then applied to the blind man's eyes. Earth, in its essence, is mere soil, yet from it humanity was fashioned. Similarly, saliva may seem ordinary, but it comprises water, a fundamental element essential for life. Jesus, in his divine authority, orchestrates the union of the spiritual and the material to catalyze miraculous occurrences. However, there is a key point in this, and it is in John 9 he told him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went washed and came back seeing. The action completed the miracle. Obedience and acting produce blessing. In conclusion, salt, an ancient instrument of warfare since the days of the Old Testament, epitomizes the sacred covenant between God and David. Its historical use spans from purifying offerings to denouncing sin-stricken territories. Salt, symbolizing the timeless and the divine, serves various symbolic roles it purifies, curses and seals covenants. Its handling demands utmost purity and reverence, from acquisition to consecration, even necessitating dedicated utensils solely for this sacred purpose. To wield salt effectively, one must be wholeheartedly devoted to God, embodying the essence of true faith. Within the realm of spiritual warfare, salt finds application in dispelling curses cast by witches, combating sin and malevolence, and expelling stubborn evil spirits. Through prayer, intercession, and a resolute rejection of vengeance, believers employ salt to cleanse spaces tainted by generational corruption, applying it over ancestral ties and sanctifying tithes and offerings at the altar. 
in homes and consecrated areas, the scattering of salt signifies divine protection, affirming their immunity against malevolent forces and spells. In Eastern traditions, salt embodies a pledge of unwavering trust and eternal fidelity, symbolizing a pact devoid of treachery or harm. Nonetheless, the efficacy of salt hinges on the bedrock of faith and an unswerving commitment to God. Final warning, are you familiar with the account of the bronze serpent crafted by Moses under God's directive as documented in Numbers 21? Following their departure from Mount Hor en route to the Red Sea, circumventing the land of Edom, the Israelites grew disheartened and voiced grievances against both God and Moses. Their discontent manifested in questions like, why have you led us out of Egypt to perish in the wilderness? There is no sustenance, no water, and we loathe this insubstantial food. In response, Jehovah unleashed fiery serpents among the people, resulting in numerous fatalities. Recognizing their error, the people sought Moses, acknowledging their transgressions against God and beseeching him to intercede. Following Moses' supplication, God instructed him to fashion a bronze serpent and mounted on a pole. Those bitten by the serpents could gaze upon this effigy and find deliverance. This act of divine mercy provided a tangible symbol enabling the Israelites to seek salvation from the venom. Nonetheless, this narrative unfolds further. Subsequently, the Israelites lapsed into corruption once more. In the Book of Kings 18, a monarch eradicated the high places, demolished the sacred stones, uprooted the Asherah poles, and shattered the bronze serpent fashioned by Moses. This was prompted by the Israelites' worshipping of the serpent, dubbing it Nehushtan and offering incense, forgetting that the miracle emanated from God and not from an inanimate idol. The same is true with salt, it should be an instrument in the service of God's children, not revered or used frivolously. Salt is a means to manifest God's authority. Be correct, be a faithful servant, and do not make the same mistake as the Israelites. Use God's tools correctly, and you will always have the favor of your Heavenly Father. Be blessed. Blessings. Do not live in complaints, mourning, or self-pity. You are a warrior in times of war, and the only goal is to move forward. There is no going back. A Christian never goes back. A Christian is faithful to their God in good times and bad. Faith must never wane. If you are a Christian, live supernaturally. If the spiritual power of salt in the Bible has amazed you, Imagine the video that appears on the screen. Click on it and discover what the Bible says about tattoos. Leave your opinion about the video topic in the comments, always respecting others' opinions. I hope you enjoyed the video. If this content was valuable to you, I ask that you support me with your subscription so you do not miss any of our upcoming videos. Share this video with family and friends, give it a like, and leave your opinion in the comments. This helps the video reach more people. Together we can enlighten more minds and expand our understanding. Thank you for being here, and may God bless you.